process is how we learn to actualize the vision of science, the new great quote, the next quote that you get to listen to help others really to make notes in China. I'm so here, you can take it to the next session. Sure. Thank you. Well, you're standing up with the physics today, uh, but you should be studying doing past papers, and we're going to help you today with that. Okay, awesome. awesome. All right, so, well, you make your way across the board. I'm going to tell them mindset is. Mindset is, you know the drill by now. You know what the link is, www.facebook.com forward slash learn extra. Talk to me, let me know what you guys are thinking. If you're lost in here, if you need help, post, 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 post. Because I have this awesome cafe calculator and this level of giveaway. Mindset is, you can make my job easy and just post on the page. And I just want to send a quick shout out to Liberty Fox, who's sponsoring the show. And my set is I cannot stress this enough. If you guys need to use this page, it is so important. Because on that note, after all, we are so close, so, so close. We're almost at 3,000. We're looking like a couple hundred people short. So my set is tell your friends to tell other friends to tell their friends to make sure that they get on the page. So we can hit that 3,000 mark and have a little party. But on that note, my set is we have a show to still do. So, so, it's all right. All right. Thank you so much. Wouldn't it be great if we managed to get 3,000 people to post that so awesome. Tell everybody, guys, get them on the page, get them liking the page. Okay, but with that note, we are finishing up with some physics revision this evening. If you guys have been watching, what we've been doing is we've been breaking it down. We've been taking the physics paper into smaller pieces, and we've been seeing what's happening inside each question step by step. So what I'm going to be doing is from question 7, last year's paper, very, very nice question. What I've asked Kai to do is to actually post them up as a gallery on the page. You guys have been using it fantastically. You guys have been using it as sort of like a revision, discussing the answers, and that's exactly what the page is for. So today we're going to carry on with the rest of physics. Now we're really talking about the last piece of this paper, is it's a lot of the new physics, the stuff which people find a little bit difficult, but there's no reason to. So I'm going to guide you all the way through it. So we're going to kick it off with some diffraction. Okay, so question seven from last year's paper. Here it is. It says that a learner investigates the change in broadness of the central bright band in a diffraction pattern. Now, this is when light passes through single slits. Okay, so that's quite important that you know what type of diffraction that you're dealing with. You're dealing with single slit diffraction. There it is. Of oh, different width. She uses a monochromatic. Okay, now that's an important word and it's quite difficult. Okay, because it's Greek. If it sounds Greek, it is Greek. Okay, monochromatic. They're going to ask different questions. Now it says violet light of wavelength. Now let's actually write that nice and big because this is quite small. So that is 4 times 7, uh, sorry, times 10 to the minus 7 meters. Now just to give you an idea, that is 400 nanometers. That is right on the edge of what we can see with our human eyes. Now it says the apparatus is set up as show, shown in the diagram below. Okay, so we've got a monochromatic violet light. And what happens is as it enters here, it's going to spread out. But now the really interesting thing is I'm going to find that on the other side of this is that I'm actually going to find these bands. Now, one of the things that's a little bit misleading about this particular picture is that you can't actually see the light and dark bands because we've had to change the colors. So what I'm going to do for you is I'm actually going to color them slightly differently. Now, using a blue pen, because this is on the blue end of the spectrum, we're actually going to show you where the bright bands are going to be. So now the bright band over here, would be the central piece. That would be the very, very bright blue part of the screen. Now, what's going to happen is as we move away from there, you're going to find these other blue lines and blue lines and blue lines. So, what you're going to find is that there's going to be gaps. There's going to be intensity right at the beginning in this middle band, and sometimes it's shown as a maximum intensity wave. That means that most of the light is falling in the middle, as we would expect if it went through a hole. Okay, but that's not where the questions are leading. Let's take a look at them before we read too much into the picture. Let's not get all confused. Let's just read the questions. Go on down, read, and let's do this. So it says, define the term monochromatic. Okay, here we go. Monochromatic. Mono means one. Chromatic is a reference to color. Now, both of these are Greek references to one color. Now, in terms of physics, we need to know that that is light of one frequency or wavelength. So that means that all the light has got one frequency or wavelength because those are related. So that means that all the light which is going through that slit has all got the same frequency and that is that violet light which means that all of that light is going to be exactly one color. I know that if I have many colors you can call this trichromatic or polychromatic many colors that means. So white 
if you see anything which is white, that means that it is polychromatic, meaning many colors. So when we see mono, that means one. That's what that word means. Okay, now we're going to start taking a look at the experiment. It says write down the investigative question for this investigation. Okay, let's see what they're doing inside this. Now, investigative questions are very, very difficult for a lot of learners. Uh, what is an investigative question? It sounds so fancy, but it really isn't. They're saying, what are we trying to find out? So it says, a learner investigates, here we go, the change in broadness of the central bright band in a diffraction pattern when light passes through single slits of different wavelengths. So we're looking for two variables. We're looking for two things to change. So what's happening? We could uh, state this as any sort of question. It's going to be a long one. You can write it out any way that you like. But there's the two things which they are looking for. We are trying to see what is the effect of different widths on the broadness of the central band. So you could ask yourself, how broad is the central band when I change the width? I need to include these two variables in that answer. That's why they're giving you those two marks. An investigative question says, what am I trying to find out? You can see there's a lot of correct answers there. I want to get on to the calculations because we're a little bit squeezed for time here tonight. Okay, so for 7.2, it says write down two variables that are kept constant. Sometimes if you do biology, especially, these are called control variables. Now, these are variables which can change the outcome of my experiment. So I must make sure that they stay the same the whole way through. So I'm just going to write down some symbols and try and figure out what the difference is between all these variables and how they might affect my experiment. Now, 7.3 says I'm looking for two variables which might change my experiment which I want to keep the same. In other words, to keep a fair test. So those two variables which are control variables, one of them would be frequency. So it even told me that there was frequency Okay, so frequency was definitely one of them. So frequency, that is definitely a controlled variable. Now, learners, please try to stay away from telling me that they must always use the same equipment, that sort of thing. That is implied. We're looking for things which are under our immediate control, which must be in this experiment. We're not looking for things which might introduce error. We're looking for variables which can change, but we're stopping from changing. So frequency is one thing which we can change. So frequency, in other words, the color of the light which we put in. Because the color can change how much diffraction takes place. Okay, so that is definitely one of the variables which I can control. Now one of the other variables which I can control is shown here in the diagram. The distance from the screen. So that is usually symbol D. So if I control that, I can control how wide it is. If I bring it closer, what's going to happen is everything not going to have as much time to spread out. So what I can say is that the distance from the screen is a very, very important thing. So there we go. Distance from screen. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a look at what happens when we start to calculate about our diffraction of the sun. It says, now the learner uses a narrower slit. In other words, that slit becomes smaller. The A value in the diagram becomes smaller. So what happens when I squeeze this into a tighter, tighter space? There is my A. What happens when I squeeze the light through a smaller space? Now, they say, how will the broadness of the central bright band change, write down only increase, decrease, or stay the same? Okay, so they're saying, will it get wider? Will it get narrower? Or is it going to remain exactly the same as it was? Okay, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a really cool analogy that I like to use. Now, I like to think of the light like water through a, through a hose pipe. And what happens is that opening, you can actually squeeze with your fingers. Now, what I want you to think about is as I squeeze that hose pipe thinner and thinner and thinner, I want you to think about what happens to the water. At first, when my fingers are not touching it, the water just goes out. What starts to happen is as I start to squeeze it through a tighter and tighter space, what happens? The water starts to spread out. And light is exactly the same way. The reason that it's spreading out is because I'm squeezing it through a tiny little hole. So what I'm saying here is that when I squeeze it through there and that hole gets smaller and smaller and smaller, that slit width gets smaller and smaller, 
what's going to happen because the light is going to get wider and wider and wider. So here's the correct answer. It's going to get larger. But now they want us to give an explanation which makes scientific sense. Okay. Now I've got to be a little bit careful here. I can't start talking about hope parts in my in my exam. That's not really correct. What we've got to do is we've actually got to say, well, which equation deals with the width of diffraction? And the only one that comes to mind is the one where I say that sine of theta is proportional to 1 over a. Now that tells me that they are inversely proportional. That tells me that the smaller the a gets, the larger the theta angle and sine theta as a result gets. So sine theta and a are inversely proportional. You may not use the word indirectly. Please, please, please. That's very, very different. Inverse means that as one goes up, the other goes down. So the slip gets small, angle gets big. That's how this one's working. Okay. Now they're going to ask us, calculate the angle of theta which the second minimum is formed if a slip width of 2.2 times 10 to the minus 6 meter is used. Okay, now I've got to be very, very careful. There's a lot of information here. So first of all, I need the angle, so theta, which the second minimum. Okay, now that's something which hasn't come up a lot. It's formed if a slip width of 2.2 times 10 to the minus 6 meters is used. Okay, well let's go to my equation and let's try and sort out what's going on. I'm going to bring up the calculator and show you exactly how to punch in these very, very difficult figures. So let's write down the information that I know. I know that my frequency is equal to 4 times by 6, uh, sorry, times 10 to the minus 7 meters. That was 400 nanometers. That's the light which is going inside there. What other information was I given? Well, I know that a slip width, in other words, A, is equal to 2.2 times 10 to the minus 6. Okay, now there's something else. Second minimum. That's a little bit of a, a warning sign here, because usually I'm only dealing with one bright band. So I'm dealing with the central bright band. But now what they've asked me to do is to go to the second bright band and go to that edge. So instead of landing up over here on my diagram, so how wide is that, they want to know how far is it going if I get to my second bright band. Well, let's use my equation. I'm going to show you exactly how to do this. So if I say the sine of theta is equal to m, now that's the one that I'm going to be looking for. So m lambda over a. Now you might say, okay, well, there's lots of information which I don't really know. What about theta? Okay? What about lambda? What about m? These are things which I haven't even started talking about. So what I've got to do, well, I've got frequency. Let's use it. Guys, you should be very, very okay with trying to change frequency and changing it into lambda. That should be something that you're very, very used to. So let's do that first. Let's find out what the wavelength of the slice is. Sorry, I've actually written this down incorrectly. I think I've made a bit of a boo-boo. I'm pretty sure you guys at home are busy screaming at me. We've already got lambda. Okay, so that is not the frequency. That is the lambda of this. Do you know how I know this? And do you know how I'm making this mistake? I can see that I've got a unit there. That is not a frequency. This is one of the easy things to find out. I've got an incorrect unit. Okay? So this definitely is a lambda. So we can chuck it straight in. That's really, really nice. Now, if you do get given a frequency, all you've got to do to change it into lambda, like I was saying, is say C divided by frequency, and that will give you lambda. Now, that's if you're given a frequency of light. So that's one alternate if you don't have lambda. I thought I didn't have lambda, but I actually do, which is awesome. So what you can do is go substitute, find my theta. So let's do this. Okay. So now, one thing which I haven't talked to you about much is M. Now, M is which band am I dealing with? They told me the second band. So that is the value of 2. My lambda value is 4 times 10 to the minus 7. So that was my 400 nanometers. And then my slip width. Just check that your slip width is already in meters. Let's check my question again. My question says, yes, it is 2.2 times 10 to the minus 6 meters. Okay, so that is, there we go, 2.2 times 10 to the minus 6. Okay, and that's pretty cool because that's going to get me sine of theta. But now for you guys that are doing math or your trigonometry is not so hot, I'm going to help you out on the calculator here. 
So I'll bring up my amazing cat here, calculator. Just remember that these things are up for grabs. Ty's busy watching the post. Okay, so let's substitute in. Let's find out what's going on there. So I'm going to say two. And we're going to close the brackets there. Now, please, guys, this is a bit of a shortcut on how to do this. The amazing thing about this calculator is it's just scientific notation. It saves me a whole bunch of time. So what I'm going to say is four. Then I'm going to use this button down at the bottom. I'm going to hold it down extra long so you guys can see what I'm saying. Four. There we go. Times 10 to the power x. And what that does, sorry, I've done it twice there. I got so excited. Okay, so 4 times 10. And whatever number you put in next is going to be the power. Now, if you put in negative 7, I'm going to say negative 7. There we go. Let's close the brackets. Let's go down to the bottom and let's put in my 2.2. .2, but we're going to use exactly the same method here. So I'm going to say 2.2 .2, and I'm going to use my exponent button there. Now that raises it to the power of 10, or an exponent of 10 rather, raised to the power of negative 6. There we go. All right. Now I've got a fraction. This is my answer. I press my S to B button. That doesn't mean a lot. And please, guys, this is not your angle. This is not your angle. This is sine theta. So I know that sine theta is equal to naught comma 3 6. Okay. So let's just write that down in case we do something wrong. So I say that sine theta is equal to naught point and it was recurring all the way. So what we're going to do is now, I'm going to save myself some time, I'm going to use the answer. So now, if I want to get the angle from something, I say shift of sine of my last answer. And that's how amazing this calculator is. There we go. So shift of my last answer, and it's going to give me this beautiful angle, so 21,32. Okay, so that's a pretty big angle for my uh, calculation, so 21.36, uh, what is 36, let's just remind ourselves, 32, sorry, okay, so that is 32 at the end of that, okay, and that is in degrees, because remember that this is an angle, so I've got 21.32 degrees, and that is my angle, please guys, I've seen a lot of metrics leave it this way, this is not your angle, and it's not what they're looking for, and they're not going to give you a mark, so please, second function sine this answer and you will get your angle. Absolutely beautiful. So what I'm going to do, just before we take our ad break, I think that's in a minute or two, is I'm going to intro the next question. Okay, now question eight is going to be a really quick one. Question eight has got to be quick. Guys, you've got to be so sharp on the ball when we're doing electrostatics. statics. Now, just remember that this is electrostatics of point charges. This is not uniform field. So the reason that I can say that this is point charges is I've got two charges separated by space. So I've got these charges, P and C on insulated stands, and they carry charges. Now, check it out. Here we go. They write it twice, right? Positive 3 times 10 to the negative 9 coulombs, and negative 6 times 10 to the minus 9 coulombs. Okay, there they are. A positive charge and a negative charge. Now it tells me that the spheres are allowed to touch. So plus, like, minus. And they get together and they transfer some charge. So it says each other and then are placed 1.5 meters apart as shown below. Okay, so let's deal with 8.1 and 8.2 and then we're going to take a short ad break. Okay, so it says in which direction will electrons flow while the spheres P and C are in contact? Right on only from P to C or from C to P? Now this one's a little bit tricky. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw onto the diagram. Remember that P is positive. So my positive charges just mean that there's too few electrons on P. On C, I find that there's a whole bunch of extra electrons. Extra negative charges are busy resting there on P. Now, one of the things that you've got to remember is that only electrons can move. Positive charges cannot move through solid objects. Okay? The only objects through which positive charges can move through, and the only exceptions, are semiconductors and through solutions where positive ions move. Okay, now you've got to tell me, where are electrons going to move? Well, where are they, first of all, and where would they like to go? What I'm going to find is that electrons like to go away from negative, but towards positive. So there's my answer. That one was nice and quick. Okay, so what I'm finding is that it's going from C onto P. That was really, really easy. Okay. Now, the next one is going to be a little bit more difficult. What I've got to say is calculate the net charge gain. Please, guys, a lot of people forgot this out when I was marking this exam. So it says calculate the net charge gained or lost by sphere P after the spheres have been in contact. Okay. 
Well, that requires me to know how much it had before and how much it had afterwards to be able to calculate that change. So let's do that quickly. So I've got positive 3 times 10 to the negative 9 and negative 6. I'm going to show you how to touch spheres in a mathematical sense. So what we're going to say is for 8.2, let's put it down here. Let's use uh, some yellow. There we go. So 8.2. Now here's your formula. When you touch two spheres, their charges are going to add to each other and then split again. So what I'm going to say is that it is Q1 plus Q2. Now this is not a formula which is given to you, but this is a method to show you how to average out the charges. So the first one has a positive charge of 3. Uh, let's just make that nice and neat. That looks like a plus. So 3 times 10 to the minus 9. Okay. Plus a negative charge of 6 times 10 to the minus 9. Okay. If I divide that entire thing by 2, and I can actually do this inside my head. It's really not that difficult. All I've got to say is plus 3 minus 6 because they've got the same power. What I'm going to find is that I'm going to get to negative 3 times 10 to the minus 9. Now I've got to divide it by 2. And that gives me an answer of negative 1.5 times 10 to the minus 9. Now my last step is to figure out how much charge there was different. So each one of these has now got the same charge. Okay, now I've got to get a before and after picture for sphere P. So what is the change in charge? So in other words, the delta charge for sphere P. There we go. Positive 3 times 10 to the minus 9 was its charge before. I subtract away. Um, sorry, that's the charge afterwards. So let's just make sure that we put that right at the end. Let's just make a bit of space there. Okay. Now, before you all get confused, what I'm doing is I'm doing final minus initial. So this is why this one has to go last. So that is my initial charge. So I'm going to do final minus initial. So let's do my final charge, negative 1.5 times 10 to the minus 9 minus those 2. And what I'm going to find is that there is a negative change of 4.5 times 10 to the minus 9 coulomb. Okay, I hope you all managed to keep up with that. That was really, really quick. Okay. But it is all grade 11 work. You should be very, very familiar with touching two opposite charges, finding the charge afterwards, and then comparing it with its initial charge. Not many more, but very useful to know. So, guys, I think I'm going to let you chill out for a little bit and uh, contribute on page a little bit, take a little bit of a break. What do you think, Ryan? I think that would be great. Mm. All right, so mine says you have to touch two opposite spheres. Make sure you come back when you're ready to take the charge out as you have. You felt that you could see in the selection code on the Facebook page. But for now, we'll see you after the break. And welcome back to the discussion. I hope you guys are ready to take the charge out in the end. You have the phone with you, so you can make sure that you post on the Facebook page and talk to me. Let me know what you guys think of the last one to do the talk. So, do I see two people? Mm. What we also found is that Whitney had a question. Okay. We wanted to find out can you please explain the following to me. For every person to be visible to his arm, which means the two sources of weight must be coherent. Okay. Now, that is, it's pretty simple. Now, coherent, if you understand the word, coherent means that they're in phase. They're vibrating in time with each other. Now, what happens there is if they're vibrating in time with each other, that means that you will find that they will make an interference pattern much, much better. So, coherent sources of light tend to make much better, much more visible um, interference patterns. If they're not coherent, generally you don't get an interference pattern. There was another question, wasn't there? Yes. We are also going to find out, can you please ask so in terms of wavelength, explain why ultraviolet light would not be visible to humans? Oh, such a nice question, Ty. Okay, now the human eye is capable of seeing only light wavelengths between 700 nanometers, which is a deep red, down to 400 nanometers, which is sort of a violet and purple color. Now, if you go a little bit further than that, when the wavelengths get shorter, what happens is that we actually don't have cells at the back of our eyes in our retina, which can pick up that light. Some insects like bees can actually pick up UV light from a seed or flower. It's pretty amazing, huh? Wow, that's very interesting. Yeah. Okay. I think we should get back into the questions. What do you think? That's all. I think so. Good, good. Okay. All right. Now we were busy with question eight, talking about charges, transfer of charges. We figured out that P had lost 
4.5, um, or at least gain 4.5. Sorry, let's just make sure that we get the same things right. So now E has gained 4.5, and when I say times 10 to the minus 9, that means that we're talking about nanos to them. Okay, so it gained 4.5. So this is the change in charge on P. That is not the charge currently on P. That's how much it increased its negative charge. So I added 4.5 times 10 to the minus 9. Now that is in Coulomb. Now in question three, uh, 4.3, um, or 4.3, this is 8.3. Oh dear. Okay. So it says calculate the number of electrons. There we go. The number of electrons transferred during the process in question 8.3. So when it's gaining 4.5 times 10 to the minus 9 Coulomb, how many electrons were responsible? Well, let me show you how to do that one. Okay. When I'm trying to find out the number of electrons, what I've got to do is I've got to compare our total charge with the charge on one electron. Now this should be a very familiar question to you because this is asked in almost every grade 11 electrostatics question. So what I'm trying to figure out is the number of electrons. So I take the total charge and I divide it by the charge on one electron. Again, this is not a method which is shown to you. This is not an equation which is given to you. So I take my total charge, so that was negative 4.5 times 10 to the minus 9, remember that was nanocoulomb, and I divide it by the charge on one electron, which is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. Now that is a number which is given to you. So let's put it into our calculator, let's use the method. So what I'm going to say is negative 4.5, use my wonderful button over there, negative 9. Okay, now put into a fraction, all I've got to do is that. There we go. It's an amazing calculator. All right, so then I say negative. Okay, let's just make sure that we're doing this correctly. Click the right button, that helps. Okay, so 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. There we go. All right, now we've got a fraction there. Fantastic, we've got our number of electrons. So 2,81 times 10 to the 10. There we go, let's write it down, round two values. Okay, so 2,81 times 10 to the power of 10. That's a lot of electrons. Okay, that's, that's around about correct. Now, for 8.4, they ask us to do something very nasty. They say, a third sphere R carrying a charge of negative 3 times 10 to the minus 9 to them is now placed between P and Q at a distance of 1 meter from P. Oh, a lot of information there. So now, what I've got to do is I've got to say negative 3 times 10 to the minus 9, it says now placed between, so somewhere between P and P, okay, and it says at a distance of 1 meter from P. So what I'm going to do is I'm now going to place my last, there it is, okay, so 1 meter away from P, what I'm going to do is I'm now going to place the new sphere, and the new sphere had a charge of negative 3 times 10 to the minus 9 coulomb. Okay, so now I've got a lot of information going on here. Let's just get rid of the confusing stuff. I don't need that anymore. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to write in the current charges of all of these guys. Okay. So, the current charge of P and T, remember, was negative 1, 5 times 10 to the minus 9. Okay. So, negative 1, 5 times 10 to the minus 9. Okay. Now, that is the charge of P and T. Remember, they've touched. They've got their new charges. Now what I've got to do is I've got to figure out the net force. I've got to find the two forces exerted by P and T on R. Okay, now this is hugely complex. What I've got to figure out is what's going on between each of these charged objects. So let's do it one relationship at a time. So let's do P and R together first. P and R both have negative charges, so they're going to repel. So what I'm going to find, and let's do this in a different color, is that R is going to be pushed to the right by P. So P is going to push R to the right. Okay? But what I find is that T is also going to push on R because it also has a negative charge. But it's going to push it in the opposite direction. So what I'm going to find is that they're going to have opposite forces on each other. So let's figure out what those forces are, and let's go for it. Okay. So let's do first the force between P and R. Okay, so there we go. So the force between P and R, and then we'll do the force between R and T, and let's figure it out. Remember that we're dealing with point charges. 
So our equation in both cases is K Q1 Q2 over R squared. So remember that R's got to be in meters. Okay, so K is my constant for my electrostatics, which is 9 times 10 to the 9 that is given to you. First charge, okay, so let's say that P is negative 1,5. Now the reason that I'm putting in the negative, some people might say, well, why do you put in the charge um, sign? Well, the odd thing is that charge can actually give you a vector answer. That's something they didn't tell you in grade 11. So negative 1,5 times 10 to the minus 9. Okay, we're going to need a little bit more space here for this meter to pass. Okay, so that is my first charge. My second charge over there, remember that was negative 3 times 10 to the minus 9. Okay, and then the distance between P and R. If I look at my diagram, the distance between P and R is actually quite simple. I know that there's one meter from P. Just make sure that you've got that nice and simple, so that's one meter from P. So it must be a half a meter from P. So this is starting to get really, really complex. This is one of those really difficult ones. So that is 0.5. Don't forget to square that. So there's a lot of information here. I've got my negative, I've got my 9 times 10 to the 9, and what I'm going to find, if I put all of this into my calculator, is that I'm going to get 4,05 times 10 to the minus 9 newtons. So 4,05 times 10 to the minus 9 newtons. But we are not done yet. Now, what I'm going to do is that this is a force of P on R. So let's actually make sure that these are both forces on R. Let's make sure that they are both in the correct format. So this is the force of P on R that we're going to work out next. So the force of P on R is 4,05 times 10 to the minus 9 newtons on R. Okay? And it is away from P. Because remember that a force is a vector. So, so away from P. Okay? So that's the direction. We've got one of our forces. Now let's get my second force. Let's get the force of T on R. Now we're going to do this exactly the same way. So the force of T on R, okay, I'm just going to go straight into the substitution, 9 times 10 to the 9. Okay, there are some differences. R is still negative 3 times 10 to the minus 9, okay, and T is also negative 1,5 times 10 to the minus 9. Okay, but now the distance is slightly different. That is 1 meter squared. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pop that all into the calculator, and I'm going to get 1,62. Sorry, let's just make sure that's correct. 1,62 times 10 to the minus 7 newtons. Okay, now here's the problem, is I've got two very different forces, and they're opposing each other. What I've got to do next is I've actually got to add these up. I've got to make sure that I've got one force and the other force adding up in the correct way. The way that I do this is using a force diagram. Okay, so my force diagram of R is I've got two forces. I've got the force of P and I've got the force of T over there. And if I add all of these together, so it looks like I've copied something down into a piece. Ah, yes, I have. Absolutely. That was a mistake. Let's just make sure that we're getting the correct numbers here, otherwise we're going to be a bit misled. Okay, so now let's put in our numbers. Let's try and figure out what the di difference is. So I've got the force of P. And I've got the force of T. Let's make sure that we put those both on there. So the force of T is 4,05 times 10 to the minus 8. Let's just make sure that I copied that down correctly. The one for T is 1,62 times 10 to the minus 7. Okay, there we go. All right, so now we've got two forces opposing each other. And all that we have to do is add them up. Now, I can see that the one from T is actually a much larger number because it's got a smaller negative power of 10. So what this means is that negative 8 means that it's a smaller number. So if I take this and I subtract away this, what I'm going to find is that my net force over here is going to equal, uh, let's say, 1,62 times 10 to the minus 7 minus 4,05 times 10 to the negative 8 over there. Right, so my end answer over there is going to be 1,2 times 10 to the minus 7 newtons. Now, which one won this fight? Well, it was T. So, away from T is my direction. Okay. Very, very tough question. 
Okay, I had to do electrostatics, I had to do Newton's, I had to do all sorts of stuff here. Okay? So, C, 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 very careful. There's two separate forces. One from C and one from C. Okay, well, let's jump into the other questions. Now we're getting into stuff that's slightly more familiar. Okay, so it says that learners conduct an investigation to verify Ohm's law. Okay, now, please, you need to know that Ohm's law is equal to, or is at least equivalent to R is equal to V over I. That means that voltage and current are proportional to each other. Then measure the current. There we go. So then measure the current through a conducting wire for different potential differences, which is voltage. So then measure the current to change the voltage. That's the theory. Okay, the results are obtained as shown in the graph below. Okay, so if they're measuring the current, that's the one that they're watching. Potential difference is the one which they're changing. Okay, so what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to say that potential difference immediately from this. We've got two variables. One is independent, one is dependent. Let's identify them before we go forward. The one which I change, remember that I is the first letter of independent. So there we go. The potential difference is going to be my independent. Okay? Alright, which makes current my dependent variable. So let's look at the question. Alright, so it says which one of the measured quantities is the dependent variable. So that's really, really easy. The way that I figured that out is this is the one that you usually measure or the one which you watch which you don't directly change. So the one which is dependent is the one which I watch, the one which I observe as a result of the other changes. Okay, so let's take a look at the other pieces. It says the graph deviates. Now this word is not a common one. That means that the graph is going away from Ohm's law at some point. Now what I can tell you is that Ohm's law. Ohm's law says the following thing. Ohm's law's big, big conclusion is that voltage and current are directly proportional to each other. Is that current is proportional to voltage. Now, if things are directly proportional, they make straight lines. So let's draw a straight line through my information and let's see where it stops going straight. So Ohm's law, Ohm's law, and what I find is that Ohm's law over here is no longer obeyed because that line is going away from Ohm's law. Ohm's law is a straight line between V and I. Very nice question. Now they want to know, write down the coordinates of the plotted points on the graph beyond which Ohm's law is not obeyed. Okay, now just remember that coordinates come from the x-axis first, then the y. So let's write this down exactly as we do in maths. So they want the coordinates. So where does this happen? If I go across on my graph, let's do this together. I found that at 4, 0 volts, what is the current? If I take a look at my current over here, I can see that that is 0, 6, 4. So 0, 6, 4 amps. There it is. There is the coordinates which I'm looking for. Now, here we go. It says, give possible reasons for the deviation from Ohm's law as it's shown on the graph. Now, here's the big assumption about Ohm's law. Ohm's law assumes that resistance remains the same. Okay, so something about this tells me that resistance does not stay the same. And the biggest effect on these resistors, when you start pumping current through a resistor, one of the biggest, most important things is that resistors will get hot. And heat can change the resistance and change as well. Okay, so over here, 9.2.2, we're looking for a change in temperature. So that's the major difference. So a change in temperature is going to result in that graph disobeying Ohm's law. It's not following Ohm's law anymore. Now, they want to know, calculate the gradient of the graph for the section where Ohm's law is obeyed. Use this to calculate the resistance of the conducting wire. Okay, now C, C, C. And let's you are actually given information about north and north, you didn't actually have any information about that. What I'm going to show you is that you may not use north and north as a coordinate. There is no information about that. What I do have information about is over here and over here. So let's use a nice long line. Let's make sure that we use wide coordinates. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to find the coordinates of these two lines. So let's actually make a nice dotted line. Okay? So there's my first coordinate. Alright, so that's what my ruler would be doing. 
and my second coordinates over there. So let's try and measure out what these coordinates actually say, and let's write them onto here. Okay, so my first coordinate is at 1, and over there, if I read that correctly, that says north comma 1, 6. So north comma 1, 6. So that's my first coordinate over there. So my second coordinate is at 3, and over there, if I go to there, it's north comma 4, 8, so around about there. You've got to use values which are actually plotted on the graph. I cannot use north and north. One of the reasons for that is because you can't actually collect any data at north and north. The graph goes through there, but there is actually no point there. Okay, so now remember, when I'm trying to calculate my gradient here, it's change in y, so it's change in current, over change in x. Now that's kind of weird, because delta i over delta v, hmm, r is equal to v over i. Now, I'll take get to that in a moment. Let's get this gradient first. Okay? So now I'm going to show you what I mean in terms of my gradient. The gradient is not the resistance itself. So let's calculate my m value, which is delta y over delta x. So that was equal to my final value of y was 3 volts minus my initial value, which was 1. Then what I've got to do is I've got to take my second value over there for current, so that's 0, 0.48, and subtract 0, 0.16. So 0, 0.48 minus 0, 0.16. Okay? All right, so that gets me 2 over, and let's just make sure that that's correct. I think that's 0, 0.32. And let's get that value quickly on our calculator before we go there. Okay, so 2 divided by 0, 0.32. There we go. I get a gradient over here of 6.25. But now remember that this is change in current over change in volts, which is the wrong way for our gradient. So what I've got to do is I've got to turn it upside down. I've got to say that R is equal to 1 over 6.25 to get my correct resistance. So there's a really neat calculator button which can do that for me. And here it is. I'm going to push it. X to the minus 1 is going to turn over my number. There we go, and there's my resistance, which is 0.16 ohms. All right, guys, um, I'm thinking it's time for a very short ad break. It is. We're going to come back and maybe answer some questions. What do you think? Oh, definitely. Sure, because this just shows the volume so quickly and it's so jam tight. But my said is, we love to see a message stick around, and don't forget, can you talk about the next note? But for now, we have to do this. Welcome back, Mindset is maybe a little break there. And I forgot to mention, Mindset is on the page, I'm sure you've seen it by now. I've actually posted up the actual questions so you guys can follow along and you on the phone or whatever you're using. So make sure you look out for that. It's written grade 12 physics revision. So make sure you look that up so you can get those notes for yourself so you can actually help yourself out. So Mindset is... I repeat again, look out on the page for the album which is grade 12, Physics Revision. That is for you guys to, to pretty much use as a study note, whatever you need to use for the exam. But on that note, my said is keep on posting on the page. Let me know if you have questions, but we have a lot to do. So, let me know. Can we do time? Okay, well, be before we went away to the break, we calculated gradient. And one thing which I did was I skipped a little bit ahead of myself and went kind of backwards. Okay, so one thing which I need to clarify is that I've already flipped these. Okay, now what I'm actually going to do to make sure that you guys have actually got this corrected is what I did was I actually flipped the X and Y ahead of time, and what I did was I originally got R directly before that gradient. So what I've done is I've done change in voltage. Okay, now that would have confused some of you of the change in current. You might have actually recognized that this is on law. So what I've actually done is 3 minus 1 over all of this will actually arrive directly at that. You don't even need to flip it if you flip it in the first step. So just to make sure that you actually understand what I'm doing, because what I said before the break, I understand is very, very confusing. Okay. Now, if I took my change in voltage over my change in current, that would give me the resistance directly. And they told me to calculate the resistance, so I could actually use Ohm's law using this. So change in voltage over change in current is the way to do this. So there we go. Is my final resistance of this item. Okay, I think I'm going to squeeze in like half a question pin, and I'm pretty sure that Tyler's actually going to stop me in my producer's going to say, no, 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 but I love this stuff. 
I want to make sure that I finish as much as possible. And as we push it all the way up to question 12, so you can guys can carry on and study late into the night. Okay, now what I've got is an experiment which says that there's a headlamp and two identical tail lamps of a scooter are connected in parallel to a battery of unknown internal resistance as shown in the simplified circuit diagram below. Okay, so here we go. We've got tail lamp 1. There it is. So tail lamp 1 and tail lamp 2 over there. Okay, and we've got two switches. Okay, now it says that the headlamp, so the lamp on the front of the scooter, has got a resistance of 2.4 ohms and it's controlled by switch 81. So we're talking about this resistor over there and that is my headlamp. Now it says the tail, uh, tail lamps are controlled by switch S2. That is over there. Okay, and the resistance of the connecting wires may be ignored. It says the graph alongside shows the potential difference. There we go. Potential difference across the terminals of the battery before and after switch S1 is closed. Now it's telling me that S2 is open. So what that means, if a switch is open on the parallel branch, that means that my tail lamps don't exist. These are completely gone. And what I can say is that for the moment, I'm not even going to consider those. Now, what it tells me is that S1 is a series resistor which is going to be switched on. Now, I can actually see from my graph something interesting is happening. The potential difference was initially 12 when there was no current. It drops to 9.6 when there is current being delivered. Let's look at the question. It says, use the graph, please, to determine the EMF of the battery. They only give me one mark. That tells me that I can just read it straight off. Now, what happens is over here is when there's no current, when I have no current, I can read the full EMF of the battery. And this is a very secretive way of telling you about that. Okay, so I know that that is actually 12 volts. Now it says, with only S1 closed, calculate the following. The current running through the headlamp. Well, this actually is as easy as electricity just gets because what they're telling me is I have got the EMF. So there's my EMF. And they've told me that the voltage, over here, my voltage, and this is actually the external. So this is how much voltage is being given to the external circuit. Lucky for us, at the moment, there's only one resistor, and there's a voltage for it. So this, this is actually very, very straightforward. Okay, so now they want the current running through the headlamp. So when I try to calculate current, I is equal to V over R, and make sure that you use V and R from the correct parts of the circuit. So I say 9.6 divided by 2.4, and I will be able to get my current there. So let's punch that into my calculator. I'll say 9.6 over there, fraction button, 2.4, or you can say divide, doesn't matter. And I'm going to give an answer of 4. Now, don't forget your units, please. They will subtract units every time. So there we go. 4 amps of current flowing through there. Okay, now I think we've got time to squeeze in a tiny little piece. It says the internal resistance R of the battery. So let's try and figure out how much internal resistance there is. Okay, now any time I deal with internal resistance, there's only one equation which is given to you in the exam, and that is this one. Let's actually label our questions. Let's make sure the people at home that are taking those beautiful notes are actually labeling them. So there we go, 10.2.1. Okay, so 10.2.2. There we go. The only equation which I can use with internal resistance is right over here. So E is equal to I with a big R and a small R. Let's use it. Okay, now the big E is my, uh, sorry, is my complete voltage or my total voltage, which is EMF, which is 12. I've worked out my current, which is 4. That's beautiful. My external resistance is capital R, so that is 2.4 plus R. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to put this all together. Let's see what comes out. Okay, so 12 is equal to, and strange enough, I times R over there. Take a look, it's actually going to come out of something familiar. That's 9.6. So that's a voltage external. Plus 4R. Let's take the 9.6 across. There we go. Minus 9.6 is equal to 4 multiplied by an R. And then let's find out what my R is. So 12 minus from 9.6 is equal to 2.4 is equal to 4R. So divide both sides by 4. This one's quite quick. And if I divide that by 4 and I divide that by 4, what I'm going to find is that R is equal to 0.6 ohms. 
So that was quite an easy internal resistance question. They actually led me up to it. Let me just re-emphasize what it's, talking, what it's talking about. It says that when I've got a switch open, so there's no current flowing through here, they're giving me the EMF. When there is current flowing, they're giving me the external voltage. How much voltage is being given out to the rest of the circuit? Now, 10.3 says both switches, S1 and S2, are now closed. The battery delivers a current of 6 amps during this period. Calculate the resistance of each tail lamp. Okay, now something has changed. The EMF cannot change. The current has changed. The internal resistance has not changed. So now, this is actually easier than it seems. The EMF has not changed. They've been told the current. So over here, um, they're a little bit generous with the marks over here, but I'm going to show you exactly how easy this is. So for 10.3, I'm going to use exactly the same equation. I might run out of time, but there we go. So I've got E is equal to I and big R. Remember, that's external resistance. So that's little r. Okay, so now my EMF is 12 volts. We've been told that there are 6 amps now flowing through this. Big R, not little r, the really cool thing is that I know that little r is not going 6. Okay, now a very clever trick which I can do is divide both sides by 6, and that gets rid of that. So it's 2, which is equal to r plus minus 0.6. Okay, now here's where the tricky part comes in. I know that external resistance is now equal to, if I take that across, 2 minus 0.6 is equal to r. I know that r is equal to 1.4. Now you might say, okay, well, I know that each one, you just chop it into two. That's not correct. Remember that you've got a combination of resistors which add up to 1.4. Basically, what I've got is I've got one resistor over there, which is 2.4 over there, and I've got these other two resistors over there, and those are contributing. Remember that this is all parallel. So I've got to use a parallel equation over here. So what I've got to say is R for the tail light plus 1 for the headlamp, and let's use my example. Okay, all right, so I think we're going to squeeze it in. Okay, so 1 over 1.4 over there is equal to 1 over my tail lamp plus 1 over my headlamp. There we go. And let's subtract those two fractions. Let's make my life nice and simple. And uh, hopefully we're going to get this in time. There's a little bit of a race against, against time. I love doing this stuff. Okay, so what I'm going to do is 1 over 1.4 minus, uh, sorry, let's actually make sure that that's the two minus. So 1 over 2.4. I think we're going to make it in time there. Okay, so now what I've got to remember is that this is 1 over R tail lamp. I've got to flip it over and the really cool thing is this calculator can do it for me. There we go. So I know that my two tail lamps together 3,36. So R of tail lamp is equal to 3,36. And this is where the marks are coming from. Okay, from this calculation, I need to chop this into 2. So if I divide that by 2, I get the resistance of each tail lamp, and I think we're sliding in just in time. So each tail lamp is 1,68. There we go. So one tail lamp is equal to 1,68 ohms. I think that's all that we have time for, Ty. Sure. That was a marathon, eh? That was. I didn't want to say anything to the rest of the The set is, is running. running. <laughs> yes, for my set is, I hope you guys enjoyed this jam-packed session with so much information to cover. But I hope, I hope, I hope that you all with it and you enjoyed yourself. My set is, I repeat again, check out the page. Look out for the album that is labeled. Um, day 12, Secrets and Visions, Good Those Notes. And also, I want to remind you guys to even the page, keep up with each other. I want to thank Liberty. Thank you for sponsoring the show. This is where me, Akai, and Flo sign off and say thank you so much. And we'll see you next time.